All right, so in this video, we're going to be talking about testing in Odin uh, and also briefly about uh, JSON decoding. Uh, well, not briefly necessarily, but JSON decoding. Um, so how do we write tests in, in Odin? Well, there are, there's a very simple way here. We're going to import the testing library. And we're going to take our parse configuration function here as a candidate for this. I like writing my tests in the same file as the function I'm testing. And we're going to say test parse configure configuration here. This is a proc that takes a T, which is a testing T. And of course, T here by convention only. You don't need to use that name here if you don't want to. Uh, first, let's look briefly at this uh, pointer here. So it's a pointer because there's a pointy thing here. Uh, as far as I know, this is a Niklaus Wirt uh, ism, uh, possibly. If nothing else, it's a Ginger Bill ism, uh, the creator of Odin, regardless. So we have a pointer to a T here. Uh, if we wanted to dereference this, we could actually say T this. So notice how uh, when we have a type, there's a pointer. We have it on the left side when we have when we're dereferencing that pointer and getting the actual value, uh, we have it on the right side. This mirrors when we have slices. So if we had a slice here of int, we would say, you know, s is uh, slice one, for example, right? Um, so type on the left, accessing on the right. Anyway, we're, not, we're only going to be using this as a pointer now regardless, so it doesn't so much matter. Uh, let's say here that we wanted to check our parse configuration function, right? So we have a few tests we can write. How do we actually write these? Well, testing.expect uh, value can work. So here we can have uh, one and two, for example, or one and one in test sandbox. Now we've written a very basic test. This passes. This does not, right? And so with that in mind, I'm going to show just a tool that I use that I find very useful. So task test dash dash watch and so on. So now I can change my tests uh, and I will automatically get this running over and over. And I get a workflow that basically tells me, you know, how much progress are you making at any one point in time and so on. And of course, uh, normally I don't have this amazingly large font that I use here. So we have significantly more space to work with normally. Uh, so uh, there are two main functions for actually writing these expectations. Uh, the most versatile of which is expect, which takes a Boolean as its second value here. And so here we can say, you know, uh, expected is one, uh, actual is one, uh, let's say two actually. Uh, and here we're going to say one equals two like this. And we're going to say fmt t printf uh, expected dash v got dash v, etc. Uh, or not per, not dash, of course, this is a percentage. So here we're going to import fmt as well. And when we save here, we're going to see that we are getting this nice message, expected one got two. So on this, this is effectively what we got in the other example, except now we can actually be much, much more precise. Uh, and this will also support things that are not comparable, because if we look here at the uh, this function here, we can actually see expect value uh, returns a bool where intrinsic type is comparable t. So it's a generic function, but it only works when type t is comparable. And of course, there are lots of types that simply are not comparable by default. Your types overall are not going to be comparable. Uh, we can't just take a configuration and uh, or some cool union, I think, and just say this is not comparable. So uh, expect is what we're going to be using, and that's pretty neat. It's neat enough. So um, let's actually turn our heads towards this parse configuration and see if we can put some JSON uh, decoding in there. 
So uh, we're going to remove this expected value. Expected here is going to be, I'm going to try to decode an empty configuration. Um, and we're going to say parse configuration uh, with byte, byte like this. Uh, and here I'm going to construct this like this. Assignment count mismatch, of course. Here we have a parsing error uh, that we can possibly have. Here we could also say uh, testing expect value. Uh, T parsing error nil. This probably won't work. It's not comparable. Yes, it's not. Okay. Or no, it's not rather. Parsing error needs to be uh, equal to nil. like this and so now uh, first of all we can see that yeah the tests are still running and so on uh, they run by default on every save uh, and so here we are now parsing an empty object here right if we were to try to parse something that simply wasn't anything at all uh, like this uh, we would see we still, uh, oh, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> we're not doing any JSON parsing, in fact. Uh, let's add some JSON encoding, encoding JSON. Like this, this gives us access to the JSON namespace. Uh, we are going to say that we have, right, so here we want to apply kind of our usual thinking where we want to inject sort of an error type into our uh, union our error union. So what I'm going to do here is just JSON on Marshall like this, take the data and give a pointer to config here. So importantly, we take some, some slice of bytes, right? And a pointer to some T here. And our T is in fact a configuration. And then we want to say, or return. This is going to throw an error or rather tell us, hey, you know, on Marshall error is not part of your union. JSON on Marshall error will solve that problem. Uh, we can now go down here again, and here we will see that, yeah, is it, it is in fact now unmarshalling into config like this. So what happens if I remove these here? Now we can see expecting no parsing error got invalid data, right? So we are in fact decoding actual stuff. And here we have an empty object. And this should tell you something, right? This tells you that um, it is in fact the case that when we have an empty config, it is simply saying, yeah, that's fine. We don't need, we have no required keys and so on. And that is a potential downside. I'm not gonna say a downside, but it's a potential downside of using unmarshal. Um, it has no concept of these keys are required uh, and so on. And there's a very easy way to, to kind of deal with that. Um, a fairly straightforward way, uh, we could have two versions of our configuration. We could have, for example, this struct that says we have a file name, which is a string. We have an interval, which uh, we could say uh, this is a string. Uh, we have a URL, which is a string. And it's going to become fairly obvious why I'm making these strings. Um, let's make uh, first Uh, a much uh, a more involved uh, te test case here. So we want to say we have a file name which is some file name .txt. Uh, we want an interval which is uh, once like this, and we want a URL which is https.example.com with a trailing slash. Uh, that's our expected two. Uh, if we have an actual two and a parsing error two here, we would say parse, uh, parse configuration. And here I actually want uh, data two here. And we're gonna say that uh, data two is uh, transmute 
to slice of byte on a string. So I promise that this will make sense once we've done it. Um, and here I'm actually going to pull this down because there, there's just a lot of text here going on. Uh, this should be fine. Let's see. Right. And here we actually want this to be that. Yes, that's correct. And we want no parsing errors, right? And so unsupported type error interval. Um, and that is, of course, because we are no longer, we are now trying to unmarshal an interval key. And our interval is not uh, parsable by default, right? There's nothing that says how to parse an interval, right? And that, that is the, one of the issues that you run into with this JSON uh, decoding, uh, right? Uh, so we're going to have to do some logic here to deal with that. And one of the things we did here was we said interval was string. And string, of course, is unmarshable, unmarshalable by default. So what we're going to do is we're going to say JSON config is a configuration JSON object. And we're going to say JSON config like this, right? And we can get the very basics out of the way by saying config.filename equals whatever you have in this. Uh, config. Uh, URL is this, but then we're going to switch on JSON config interval and say case never uh, means that we have uh, never. Case once means that we, we have once, of course, and every milliseconds means that we have uh, this. And no, here we actually want to parse this. So we're going to use uh, uh, I uh, parse success string conv parse int on JSON config interval. And so string conv, we're going to have to import like this. Uh, and this now is set to interval i, it should be, if, uh, if parse success, I should say. And then we close the switch. And now we can see that actually the tests succeed on the right side. Right, so now we're parsing this once, we're parsing... Uh, mm, hang on, no, there's something wrong here a little bit. Let's see here. Ah, uh, no, once. Yeah, of course. Uh, if we actually made a test case here with some number, we would actually find out that, no, 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 this doesn't make sense. Uh, here, what we're going to do, case every milliseconds is actually not what we want here at all. What we want is, in the default case, when it's never, it's not never or once, we want to actually parse this as an integer and see, was that successful? Well, in that case, we want to set every milliseconds, for example. You could say, you know, I want to parse this uh, as a JSON object, for example, and then, you know, go from there, for example. And that would be valid as well. But yeah, so this is a very basic way of kind of doing this. And it, basically, we're, we're splitting up the reading process into two steps. Uh, parse into something that where Odin already understands how to get these values, uh, and then have a function translates that into what you want, right? So you can view here, uh, you can view configuration here as being our internal format, right? That the program actually uses. And configuration JSON is simply the interface by which someone actually uses this, right? And so that's a completely valid way of doing this. Actually, I have a uh, very little, little problem with this, uh, with doing this. There is, however, uh, an alternative way of doing this that could also be relevant uh, that we can show uh, very briefly here. So um, we're going to get rid of most of this and we're going to say that uh, we are going to parse this into some kind of object, JSON value. Uh, and we're going to do JSON parse on data or return. And you'll see here that uh, 
give it a comment string conv and here um, we are not handling json error so we're gonna just say json error here and now our main problem is we're not using json value so what do we actually want here well uh, we want a uh, json object so here i'm going to say object is object um, json value json object so json object here is really just a way of saying map string value it's using distinct types uh, which are ways of saying yeah this is you can consider it in terms of you know uh, internal type map string value but it's it is distinct from them you can't just use any map string value with this value Right, so if we tried to take an object as a parameter to a, a function, we couldn't just pass a map string value. Um, and so here we have a map of string to value, right? And this is a recursive type, obviously, because what we were actually looking at here, value, is all of the JSON types. So this is a map from string to all of those types, right? Which is exactly what a JS object is. So we want an object. We want certain keys to be present inside of these uh, as well. We want to pull out some data, right? Um, and here we want to say, if it's not an object, return uh, configuration and invalid value, let's say that, where value is now our JSON value. And we're going to change that type slightly now. Uh, here we want to have JSON.value like this. And now we should be fine here. Object is declared but not used, yes. Uh, and so here we could say now that we want different keys. We want to pull different keys out. So for example, if I now say um, file name and file name is string like this, we could now say object file name JSON string like this. And this would allow us now to, well, uh, check for this, right? Uh, importantly, one of the differences here between this and the other method is that note here that null is an actual kind of value that exists. Note also that it's the, basically the, uh, it's the first one here, but that we have no, no nil specification. So we have nil and null, which are different. And if this JSON string is not actually uh, the case, let's say, right? We're going to have nil as a value, right? So what we could do here, um, we could say if, uh, uh, let's do this. If file name is string, like, like this, right? Uh, we could now say, oh, invalid value. But there's a small detail there, there that we will take a look at, right? URL, uh, URL is string, and exactly this again, right? Now, interval is interesting, right? First, we want to create an interval object that we're going to be using and filling in. And then we're going to say interval string. Interval is string, right? We're going to check for this, right? Uh, and then we're also going to say interval uh, int, right? This is the other case that we had before. Now we're going to say if uh, interval is string, we're going to say uh, case on, uh, or switch rather, on interval string. If it's never, we're going to set the interval to never. If it's once, we're going to set it to once like this and case. Um, yeah, here we don't actually need to have a lot more, but we're going to say invalid value in this case. And here we're going to have else if uh, like this and the interval is going to be set to every milliseconds interval int. Yeah, that's about correct. I think here, if we save this, however, uh, assignment count mismatch interval int interval is int uh, let's see here what are we doing 
Mm -hmm. File name declared but not used. Ah, right. Uh, config file name. File name. We do have some other error though. We're going to take a look at that briefly. Uh, and here we want config interval equals interval. Uh, here we are having some kind of issue. Uh, da, 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 da. I saw account mismatch. Ah, right. Integer, I think, is the correct one here. And there you go. Cannot assign value interval int of type i64 to uh, int. And this you can actually just cast away here. And don't worry here, we couldn't just say whatever, you know, we couldn't just do whatever we wanted here. Um, we can't just downcast this to something crazy and so on. But we can, in fact, cast uh, from int 64 to int. So expected no parsing error got invalid value, value nil. And that is actually by design. If we look at this, right, so like I told you before, find them is string here, check specifically. We're checking specifically for string. Right. And in our test, we can actually see that we are not expecting a file name uh, to be uh, set here. Uh, or rather, well, we're expecting this to sort of just go through. Right. Uh, we're kind of following the same behavior as unmarshal in the first test. Right. If you have an empty object, you should just sort of pass everything through. Right. And this, of course, um, doesn't necessarily work uh, if we have this code here, because we're checking for a string. We're not handling nil at all. And so what we could do here is have an or uh, file name uh, is uh, nil, like this, um, or it's not nil, rather, an and. Sorry, if it's not a string and it's not nil, right, would be what we're saying here, right? Uh, and here we have this exactly like this. Uh, to string, ah, of course, uh, these are not actually. Uh, well, let's do object file name like this. There you go. Uh, and let's see here. Here we can actually add some better uh, field we can say here, which is a string. Now we can set field here. Right, and then we, we can see then that it has to be one of these other ones. Field is uh, uh, interval, obviously. So in our interval checks, of course, we are uh, missing something here. Right, well, obviously. Uh, we would have to have this check here, right? Uh, basically, to have this work out. Um, Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. We are, if it's not, if it's an int. Oh, no. Uh, this is not going to work here, of course. Uh, we would have to have an else that says, you know, specifically, hey, else, um, else if 
uh, object interval is nil and we want to do some stuff right if it's nil uh, we might for example set it to another like this for example and here oh hang on did we set did we remove no nil no nil ah we removed no nil oh that's my mistake uh, never is, of course, not the the thing we want in that case. We actually want nil, and that passes our test. This got a lot more complicated than I expected it to become, but yeah, such is life when you don't rehearse. Um, so now we can see here that one, um, the version we had before, while it did make some assumptions, sort of that we might not want to take on always. Right, it was fairly convenient for what we were doing, um, and so I think these two methods of decoding JSON and so on, encoding is really straightforward to be honest. Uh, it shouldn't be that much of an issue, regardless. Um, decoding JSON here is you probably want to maybe default to the first one version we showed. If you can describe your kind of interface data structure in basic types and so on, and then have a function that translates that to your internal type. I think that's a great way of doing things, generally speaking. Especially it's a great way of doing things initially, right? This version here is significantly, let's say, more imperative, uh, but that also gives you the upsides of imperative code. We can be hyper-specific. We can very uh, accurately describe the flow of things right we have full control of exactly the whole decoding process you could make you could write any code here to do what you need to do and that is an upside i mean it might not seem like it looking at this code but this is an actual upside if you want complete control over the whole decoding process this is a fine way of doing it so i guess the takeaway here should be uh, default to json on marshall but if you want control and very accurate slash specific decoding, use JSON parse. So I hope this was useful. Um, I, I really recommend looking uh, at task file, so HTTPS taskfile.dev if we go to my task file here you'll see that there is not much to it we have a version description this is a yaml file that's of course sad but i can say that it doesn't matter so much for this tool uh, we have a default task so if i write task for example we're going to run the default right uh, uh, we have uh, commands that we run for each task. Here I'm defining the test task. The command is Odin test sandbox. It has an alias, so we can run task t. Uh, the method here uh, basically refers to should we, how do we check that we need to run this thing again? So if we had a build task, for example, we could say uh, build here. We would have some CMDs, which is Odin build sandbox, right? And this actually might be old in build sandbox O. Uh, o uh, I think it's O. Hang on, actually, let me check. Old in build help. Yeah, so we can have out here. Um, out is bin sandbox, for example, right? This is what I usually use. We can also specify collections. Uh, collections are basically, you can specify your dependencies, what, how they should be named in your program, um, and so on. So here we might have this very basic uh, kind of uh, command here. The alias is uh, dash b, or yeah, the, just b. Uh, method is actually, we're not gonna set that. It's gonna use the file timestamps uh, for that, silent, 
generally speaking, you want to be true. Uh, that doesn't output any commands uh, when it's running them. The sources here are going to be the same as for our other thing. And sources are used for determining, determining when to rerun a thing. And here we're going to use also generates uh, because we are generating an artifact. So that will be in the sandbox. If that doesn't exist, it will always run build. So for example, if I were to say task B here, uh, let's see, no write permissions for output path. Here we can, can say mkdir bin task B. Now it ran this. Right, so we, we can look at la bin and we get this file here. And, and so on. So this is a very basic, straightforward way to do your basic kind of build scripts, test scripts and clean and all of these things. Uh, I like it a lot. Um, this is what I use in all my projects ever since, well, someone recommended it. Um, and uh, yeah, I find it to be a really, really nice way, especially uh, this here, task test dash dash watch, right? Uh, this is just a delightful way to work. And I mean, this is of course, uh, because Odin does not have a watch mode in its compiler, right? So we have to use something else. Anyway, that's it for testing uh, JSON decoding. Uh, and I hope that this was useful. Uh, if you have any suggestions, as usual, uh, write a comment. Uh, please do subscribe, uh, like the videos and, and so on. Uh, mostly I, I'll say at the moment it's because it's kind of, it makes me happy, to be honest. Um, and uh, it will be better for the, the channel with feedback and all of these things in the long run. So with that, uh, we're done with testing and JSON decoding for now. Uh, have a good one and ciao.